From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. Social movements in Ecuador have been protesting outside the National Assembly on the day that President Lenin Moreno gave his annual report to the nation. Surrounded by police, the protesters demanded an end to the government's austerity policies. These include increases in fuel prices and cuts in public spending as part of an agreement with the IMF. They also condemned the alleged involvement of Moreno and his brother in a corruption scandal. The president was accompanied by an honor guard as he made his arrival at the assembly on the second anniversary of his taking office. Moreno defended his record. Moreno defended his record and said his deal with the International Monetary Fund had enabled the government to protect public resources. Trade unions are currently preparing a general strike against the agreement. We have now regained the confidence of the international community whose support we need to fulfill our prosperity plan. This economic plan is already backed by $10.2 billion in long-term, low-interest foreign loans. Indigenous communities from the Ecuador and Amazon also protested against a decree signed by the government which modifies the protected area of their lands. Communities rallied in front of the environmental ministry in Quito to stand against it. The decree would allow oil drilling in areas adjacent to the protected zones of the Yasuni National Park, putting at risk the lives of uncontented indigenous peoples at the forest ecosystem. What is going to happen to us? The Taro, Minani, and Waorini communities will be left without clean water. This is our home. We don't want to die. This decree opposes Article 57 of the Constitution, which says there is no chance for fuel companies to drill the lands of indigenous communities. This new decree opens up this possibility. Honduran water rights activists are exploring their legal options after a mine was opened without input from nearby communities as required by law. Residents believe the operations have contaminated the Huapino River, the main source of water for about 42,000 people. What's worse, they say, is that the company received authorization to operate from the government, but the community was never consulted. We fight to defend the environment, particularly the river, because without crucial water source, we do not have life. And we are asking the government and the mining company to leave our river untouched. Back in February, residents filed a complaint about the lack of transparency around the mining concession granted to the mining company. So far, nothing has come of it. Members of the community who are defending water rights have also been criminalized. We said we're going to take this final course of action for this company to pack their bags and leave the same way they came. The ill effects of the river could be seen for the past seven months. We could neither use the water for cooking nor for washing our children's white school shirts. Those who could afford to bought water, many cannot. The destruction of protected areas in Honduras is part of the assault on common property that is taking place in various communities. Back in August of 2012, the Honduran Congress established the Carlos Escalares National Park in the Botaderos Mountains, where seven rivers have their source, including the Waipanol River. Then Congress, through a decree, modified the boundaries of the park's core zone, which allowed mining companies access to more than 2,000 hectares. We no longer have peace just because we defend this river. This river was once beautiful. It was wide and full of water. Now we are sad because look at how the water has changed. This river was never like this. It is true that in the summer it dries up, but now it's even drier. It pains us to see this happening. 
Water activists are accusing the central and municipal government of colluding with the mining company to intimidate the people who live in nearby communities. Protesters are now exploring their legal options. We are in the process of finding a legal means of undoing what was wrongfully done. Just like this, illegal concessions were granted by Congress with the validation of the court. We believe the decree which modified the boundaries of National Park School Zone can be annulled. With a total of 18 mining projects given the green light to operate in the Carlos Escalares National Park, Activists vow to continue defending the drinking water of numerous communities. Moving on, the battle is on to replace Theresa May as a British Prime Minister after she announced she would stand down on June 7th. May made the announcement outside her residence at Downey Street. However, she will remain as acting Prime Minister until her Conservative Party chooses a new leader, probably in July. May had little choice but to resign after members of her own cabinet forced her to suspend her fourth attempt to get Parliament to vote for her Brexit agreement with the European Union. The Prime Minister broke into tears as she finished her statement. I tried three times. I believe it was right to persevere, even when the odds against success seemed high. But it is now clear to me that it is in the best interests of the country for a new Prime Minister to lead that effort. So I am today announcing that I will resign as leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party on Friday the 7th of June, so that a successor can be chosen. I've agreed with the party chairman and with the chairman of the 1922 committee that the process for electing a new leader should begin in the following week. I have kept Her Majesty the Queen fully informed of my intentions and I will continue to serve as her Prime Minister until the process has concluded. Now, seven or more conservative figures are likely to stand to replace Theresa May as leader of the Conservative Party and therefore as Prime Minister. The favourites, including Boris Johnson, are likely to push for Britain to leave the European Union even without any agreement. The opposition leader, Jeremy Corbyn, said that Theresa May was right to resign. He added, however, replaces her as a leader of the Conservative Party must call an election. Do you think it was the right decision for the country for her to stand down? Yes, because she clearly cannot command a majority in Parliament. She clearly has lost the confidence of her own MPs. And uh, in all the discussions she's been having with her MPs, they've all said one thing to her, that they don't support her strategy. What she was offering what had already been put on the table. Yes, we want to prevent a no-deal Brexit, and we will do everything in Parliament to prevent a no-deal Brexit. But the reality is, a new Conservative leader isn't going to solve the problem. So what should be the first thing, then, that the new Prime Minister does when they come into office at the end of July, probably? Call a general election, so that we can have an election to decide the direction we go as a country. Telstra's political analyst Tariq Ali told us that May's resignation could be another step towards a split in the ruling Conservative Party. I think what we are, in fact, uh, observing is a de facto split in the Conservative Party. This is largely a party where the average age of the membership is between 55 and 60. Very few young people are joining uh, this party. Uh, and it's a party in its death throes, literally, I mean, <laughs> biologically, but now also politically. A number of Conservative members of Parliament have said that if Boris Johnson is elected leader, they will resign from the Conservative Party and obviously move to some sort of centrist uh, uh, formation. But it is, you know, one has to say, a huge crisis for the British ruling class. They've had three years to come up with a plan to implement the referendum, which was, after all, voted in by a majority. I mean, over 17 million people voted to quit the EU. Instead, 
a bulk of the establishment has been working on ways to stop, uh, find ways to stop implementing this, looking for magic solutions, coming up with concessions to the EU which make the referendum largely irrelevant, to be perfectly frank. Uh, so I think Corbyn calling for a general election is absolutely correct. The Tories, they insisted on a referendum. They pushed a referendum through. They have not been able to deliver on the results of the referendum, and they are now in a very deep crisis. Tariq Ali also said that Jeremy Corbyn had been right not to compromise with May on her deal, and that the Labour Party is now well placed for an early general election. I think Corbyn is in a strong position, uh, provided his own parliamentary party uh, decides to back him and not start leaking stuff against him, not weakening Labour by attacking him nonstop, etc. There will be, I think, attempts to remove Jeremy Corbyn yet again before the next general elections, but let's hope they fail and let's hope they see sense. There are many Labour MPs who would rather Labour lost the election than see Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister. And this narrow-minded sectarian factionalism will not do Labour any good, but I think Corbyn's big strength is that he's the only Labour politician with a huge mass appeal, uh, not simply to people of his generation, but to young people as well. And winning the youth to his side uh, during this campaign will be very crucial. But Theresa May is certainly not the first British Prime Minister to call it quits. Long before her, Margaret Thatcher, John Major and Tony Blair all left Downing Street after resigning. Let's take a look back at some of, the, of, some of those unforgettable farewell moments in history. We're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years. And we're very happy that we leave the United Kingdom in a very, very much better state than when we came here 11 and a half years ago. Now it's time for a new chapter to open, and I wish John Major all the luck in the world. He'll be splendidly served, and he has the makings of a great prime minister, which I'm sure he'll be in very short time. Thank you very much. Goodbye. When the curtain falls, it's time to get off the stage and that is what I propose to do. I shall therefore advise my parliamentary colleagues that I believe that it would be appropriate for them to consider the selection of a new leader of the Conservative Party to lead the party through opposition during the years that lie immediately ahead. Wednesday, I would attend the House of Commons for Prime Minister's questions, and then after that, uh, I expect to go to the Palace and offer my resignation. So we'll have a new Prime Minister in that building behind me uh, by Wednesday evening. Thank you very much. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Residents in the Brazilian city of Barao de Cocais fear a nearby dam owned by the company Vale may collapse soon. Earlier this week, state environmentalists said a spillage in the emb embankment at one of Vale's mines could trigger a dam burst. Over 450 residents have already been evacuated from the area. The dam is less than 70 kilometers from Brumandinho, where toxic mud from a dam collapsed by the same company. Uh, the same company killed more than 240 people in late January. Brazil's far-right government has called for big demonstrations of support this Sunday to counter recent mass protests against the policies of President Jair Bolsonaro. But as support for the government continues to dwindle, more and more of his former allies have come out against Sunday's demonstrations. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Brian Muir, has more. After millions of Brazilian students and teachers took to the streets to protest far-right Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro's draconian budget cuts to the public education system, his government announced they were going to have a massive protest this Sunday in cities across Brazil. As momentum seemed to be building for this protest, however, some of his key allies started dropping out, and it now looks like it's going to be yet another failure in this, the least popular presidency of the last 20 years. Bolsonaro was elected with a lot of support on social media. One of his biggest support groups was called the MBL, the Movimento Brasil Livre, and they released a video to their millions of social media followers this week suggesting that Bolsonaro either resign or kill himself, and they told their followers to not go to the protests. Then a second key actor in Bolsonaro's electoral victory last year, Pastor Janaina Pasquale, who's a lawyer who drafted Dilma Rousseff's impeachment legislation in 2016, called to not participate in these Sunday's protests. It looks like the protest marked by the conservatives on Sunday is going to be a victim of massive infighting among the Brazilian right. As journalist Leonardo Atush said, it looks like the rats are jumping from the Bolsonaro ship. We thank Brian Muir for that report. The economic blockade against Venezuela is having a serious impact on food supplies for the population by preventing imports. To counter this, efforts are being made to boost local harvests and to expand urban agriculture. Here in this public park lies an experimental center that produces organic fertilizers. Small farmers from around Caracas are trained here to produce food for national consumption. This is especially important since Venezuela has issues importing food and agricultural supplies due to the illegal blockade. We must bear in mind that all pesticides were previously imported, and this has to lead a decline in food production. Now we need to produce our own agriculture supplies to ensure that we are able to plant our own food. This is fundamental for every revolutionary process. We began as a center for urban agriculture. However, given the demand from the No Corona Country Plan, we are proposing the idea of producing 25,000 liters of bio products per month, which will be distributed to our farmers at the lowest possible cost. The aim is to set up another 80 centers like this throughout the country to promote food production to meet the needs of the communities nearby. We have been trying to find ways of planting in small spaces in the city of Caracas, using the fertilizers we produce here. We don't need to depend on having big areas to cultivate. We want to be able to produce ourselves to meet our own needs. In September 2017, 18 million food deliveries from the local food committees, or CLAPS, were blocked because of financial restrictions on paying the suppliers. In November of that year, another 23 food payments worth $39 million were blocked by international banks. This occurred again in May 2018, with 400,000 kilos of food blocked from leaving Colombia. The entire population must join in food production. That will reduce the impact of the blockade imposed by the United States. The solution to this problem is to produce our own food. Unfortunately, historically, we've grown accustomed to living off the country's oil production. Now we see young people growing their own food. This is a step in the right direction, in light of the negative effects of the economic blockade. Now, 
People are forced to grow everything they consume, and that is the type of liberation we need. The illegal blockade against Venezuela is estimated to have cost the country $30 billion. Economists calculate that with just the $1.2 billion of gold sequestered by the Bank of England, it would be possible to pay for food for some 6 million Venezuelan households for six months. Kenya's High Court has refused to scrap laws criminalizing homosexuality. The court rejected gay organizations' claims that the colonial era law violated the new constitution, which guarantees equality, dignity, and privacy. The penal code states that anyone with carnal knowledge against the order of nature can be imprisoned for 14 years. However, the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission says it has dealt with 15 prosecutions under the penal code in 2018 with no convictions. The commission had argued for the law to be scraped because it gives rise to a climate of homophobia. We're absolutely disappointed that the courts have decided to um, interpret the provisions of the Constitution as not protecting everyone. It's um, truly a shame to see that this is how the courts have decided. However, we still continue to believe in the rule of law and we are going to appeal this decision and see this through to the very end. Rockets have hit a hotel in Libya's capital Tripoli in an attack the UN-recognized government has blamed on eastern forces trying to capture the city. The attack damaged the entrance to the conference center adjoining the hotel, shattering its windows. The hotel serves as a base for lawmakers of the government. At least 510 have died and over 82,000 people have been displaced by the clashes since last month. The liberation movement for Guinea-Bissau led a march in the capital Bissau to celebrate African Liberation Day and to show support for Venezuela. Guinea-Bissau is celebrating the hard-fought achievement of Africa's freedom from European colonial powers. Marchers are also protesting against the U.S. blockade on Venezuela and demanding an end to U.S. imperialism and intervention. The African Liberation Day march was also staged by the economic community of West African states. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. At least two people have died and dozens are injured after a bomb went off in a mosque in Quetta, Pakistan during Friday prayers. Authorities say three of those injured remain in critical condition. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack. This latest attack took place in the province of Balochistan, which has seen growing violence over the past few years at the hands of Baloch separatists as well as the Taliban and Islamic State. And at least eight people have been injured after an explosion in a central street in Lyon, France. President Emmanuel Macron referred to the blast as an attack during a televised speech. According to authorities, the package was filled with screws and bolts. As tensions rise between the U.S. government and Iran, President Donald Trump has announced that 1,500 troops will be sent to the Middle East. This follows a recent deployment of U.S. ships and warplanes to the region. We want to have protection. Uh, the Middle East, we're going to be sending a relatively small number of troops, uh, mostly protective. And uh, some very talented people are going to the Middle East right now. And we'll see how and we'll see what happens. 
Thousands of students in more than 100 countries around the world have joined protests against climate change. They're demanding more effective climate protection from world leaders. Swedish teen climate activist Greta Thunberg led the rally in her country. The 16-year-old inspired global climate protests when she began weekly sit-ins outside the Swedish parliament every Friday in 2018. She is once again calling for meaningful action on climate change and effective policies. What we do has enormous importance for the future living conditions on Earth. We are facing an existential crisis. Time is running out. To the adults who say that we say, go on a strike yourselves. And thousands of young climate activists in Belgium have also walked out of classrooms as part of the school climate strike movement. Protest organizers say youth around the world are taking the lead and putting the issue on the global agenda. Climate change wasn't a priority or even a topic on the agenda before and now it really is, people are talking about it. And I hope that lots of people will vote thinking about we need to do something about the climate change and thinking about which parties are taking that as a priority right now. German youth have also taken up the mantle. They're marching against inaction on climate change. The students have also skipped school to fight for a greener planet. The young protesters marched to the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, where they called on banks to steer their funds towards protecting the environment. We are here today in front of the ECB because we want to remind banks in general, and the ECB in particular, that there's still a lot we can do for the climate, and that the ECB has a responsibility it is not taking on at the moment. The environmental group Extension Rebellion has blocked access to the Norwegian Central Bank in Oslo to protest against ineffective measures against climate change. Demonstrators have demanded that Norway stop investing its $1 trillion wealth fund, the world's largest in companies that burn coal. And students in India have also taken climate matters into their own hands as they march to demand a healthier and cleaner planet. Students are hoping to spark widespread dialogue about climate change and spur world leaders into action. India is home to some of the most polluted cities in the world, including its capital, New Delhi. We do not want a world which has been used and overused and squeezed the life out of. We want a world which has been nurtured, has been cared for, because that's what we, what they need to give to us in order for us to give it to our children and our children to give it to their children. I'm here because I think something that needs to be, I think something that we're not recognizing and all the turmoil, there are so many problems in the world that we're forgetting one of the most important ones. We're getting lost in drama, politics, but the most important, the politics and all wouldn't be there if we weren't alive. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.